You mentioned uh, soccer. Actually, we didn't want to talk about it, but I remember one bad joke when I listened to you. You know, about uh, the little children in the Netherlands, they have very long arms. It beca- you know why? Because they are held up and people, their parents tell them, look there, a football ch- champion uh, is over there in Germany. This is why they have so long arms. That's the bad joke. Well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk briefly about these topics with you both, Mr. Dombret, uh, Mr. Nod, because I think that supervision and sustainability, this has to be explained. I think it's not so easy to understand why we discuss these topics so intensely. Of course, sustainability for investment and climate-related risk, that's clear. What what does it have to do with supervision? Dr. Dombret mentioned it. There are climate-related risks, but these are not new risks for supervision. We talk about market risks, operational risks, credit risks. And uh, so these climate-related risks, is it difficult for supervision to deal with these topics? Is it because of the sustainability, because we don't think of these topics, because we leave them and um, out and ask our successors to deal with them. What are the major challenges for the supervisors now? What should be dealt with? Uh, a forward-looking approach. And you have while, to, uh, you have to see the there coming is, risks. There's no other way. You have to see the coming risks. And I agree that these risks will manifest itself through the traditional risk uh, channels. But this time, of course, the source of the risks is uh, different. It comes from a new source. And while the economy is continuously undergoing transition, and banks have continuously financed transition. So in in essence, that's nothing new. Uh, We move from agriculture to sort of uh, industrial production to services. All these kinds of transitions have been sort of well accompanied uh, by, uh, by the banking sector. I do think that maybe this transition might be much more sort of intrusive than many of the previous uh, transitions, possibly even bigger and more intrusive than the IT revolution uh, that we've had uh, over the last few decades. And and also here, since it is a longer term project, the earlier you start, the lower the cost will be. Because the later you start, the more ad hoc the adjustments will have to be, the more ad hoc the, the adjustments will have to be, the higher the adjustment costs will be and the higher the losses that will have to be suffered. So for me, it's just a combination of taking a forward-looking approach and personally being impressed by the size of the transition that I think is, uh, is still ahead of us. Yeah. Dr. Dombred, you talked about um, uncharted territory. So what should the supervisors do in this context? And you said that the institutions have to prepare for many topics. Is this sufficient? And um, Professor Knott said that there was a survey in the Netherlands about um, one million loans. Is it sufficient to have some expertise about upcoming risks? Or should the banks in Germany also prepare better to um, to this new environment? Should, will there be a new survey or new uh, reporting forms? Let's analyze this briefly. I didn't talk about, I didn't say many questions. I just said that there will be some questions and uh, there are also expectations. It's not about uh, bureaucracy. It's a very important topic. If we assume that climate change is one of uh, the most imminent risks for humanity and if you work in a bank, in a financial institution, and you do not prepare, uh, you're not prepared for this risk, then this would not be responsible. So we don't say, okay, there's a risk, and we do not care about it. For me, the um, short time frame is uh, really essential. There will be really 
high risks and our the future generations, our children will be uh, mainly affected. But normally, analysts, when they look ahead, they uh, try to um, prepare some forecasts for the next five years. But we cannot predict the technological change and we cannot be very precise. So actually, there are different time horizons. And this is why it is so difficult for supervisors and for banks to see what the real effects and repercussions will be. There are real risks. And later on, there will be a discussion panel and then some uh, bank representatives will tell us what happens in their institutions. And uh, some European institutions, they um, participated in this barrier refinancing and there will be some other examples and there will be some um, impairment needs for these loans extended and uh, I also mentioned the the shares equities in certain areas so it's not about um, reporting and it's not about the identification of the issue is we just have to become aware of the issue first so a paradigm shift is essential we have to be aware of the risks and we have to take account of these risks when we deal with market risk credit risk and operational risks. So it's not only about having a green image and just telling people that we are greener now, which is not bad in itself. It's important to have a new approach and uh, this is also important for the financial sector. You mentioned some figures, uh, Dr. Dombret, with regard to financial institutions. Did you try to find out the number of loans that defaulted due to the phasing out of a nuclear energy? Uh, we should uh, have an idea of the dimensions. Well, I uh, can raise again the same question that I raised before. The nuclear energy sector is quite specific, and this is not about uh, defaulting credits. Uh, climate change goes far beyond this, and this is what Klask not, not also mentioned. It is um, a very great dimension. It's not only about um, defaulting loans. If we just deal with uh, defaults, then we do not really meet all the requirements. Insurance companies and reinsurance companies are also concerned. Of course, there is clearly visible, but all other areas are also affected. And um, well, we need a paradigm shift. For me, it's easy to understand when I have some specific figures at hand. That's actually uh, what it is all about and we cannot explain it just uh, by quoting some figures but w we um, have to warn the people what can we do to um, change the awareness I think in the Netherlands it's quite clear with the altitude there it's easy to understand and uh, it's easier to understand than in Bavaria uh, uh, this is why the Dutch people uh, buy these vi uh, villages in Hesse because of the altitude when you carried out um, the analyses and the service in the Netherlands did you also check the risks that you have in mind and whether they are covered by insurance companies. Isn't it rather an insurance-related topic and less a supervision-related topic? ...that I mentioned, clearly the first one was indeed uh, the insurance risk. The second one looked on, on uh, the risk of flooding, which is uh, quite a, a significant risk uh, given the geographical characteristics of, uh, of the Netherlands. So yes, absolutely, these, these risks are, are there in the in, uh, insurance industry, but they're also there in the banking industry. As I mentioned, uh, around 11% of the exposures are to industries that at least at this moment are clearly too carbon intensive to, uh, to be able to continue uh, in the same manner. I mean, uh, the Dutch economy, uh, we have a huge uh, chemist, uh, chemical industry sector. Yeah. We are big in transportation. Well, these are... Shipping as well, huh? Yeah, uh, the, the shipping. Uh, the, these are all sectors that are quite uh, polluting. And, of course, the 
for, I'm an economist, so uh, apologies if I talk too much economics here, but I believe in pricing and incentives, and the underlying problem, of course, is that the costs of pollution are insufficiently internalized. So there is underpricing of uh, pollution risk, and it's a very simple truth everywhere uh, in the financial sector or society at large where there is underpricing of risk, inevitably, history has demonstrated, there will be excessive risk-taking. And at some stage, excessive risk-taking uh, will come to haunt you. And this is true. Well, should we talk here about sovereign risk? Should we talk here about climate-related risks? To just mention a few. That's, that's I think, the underlying, uh, underlying mechanism. So the first thing we have to do is get appropriate carbon pricing, which is, of course, outside the remit of, 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 of banking mm. supervision. Mm. But I think it's even much more important that we sort of get appropriate pricing of the pollution, of brown financing, rather than trying to subsidize green financing, which would then uh, run the risks of these uh, artificial sort of bubbles being inflated. Well, um, another question. During your speech, you said that you changed your mission uh, statement and in order to make clear that you want to have a sustainable approach. Has this triggered a change of the awareness of the supervised institutions? As the central bank in the Netherlands now wants to have a um, sustainable approach? Uh, in the Dutch banking sector is that they are very much aware of these risks that immediately after the publication of the Paris Agreement the Dutch Banking uh, Association also came out with a climate statement sort of statement of intent that the Dutch banks were aware of these risks that they fully supported the goals and that they stood ready to finance the goals because of course this is not just about risks and incurring costs and capital this is also it also has huge investment opportunities and let's not forget it uh, this energy transition is not just about downside there's also a lot of uh, upside involved in there so the dutch banking association has been quite proactive in sort of communicating on this is also because this was also a way to sort of restore some of their reputation because their reputation had, of course, been significantly tarnished yeah, by the financial crisis. You have to it's take probably, care it's not only the green face. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, it's more than the green face. But, but clearly, I think the reputational aspect also played mm -hmm. a role that the bankers wanted to show that they understood what was going on in society, that there is a broader interest here, and that they wanted to be part in that, uh, in, in, in that process. And that, I think, is, is the right thing to do. Mr. Dombret, what's your experience and to your colleagues and Mr. Lupa's experience here in Germany? Listening to conversations, is this topic being discussed in the banks? Is this considered maybe an expansion of the mission, maybe not of the mandate, but of the mission of the supervisors to establish this more in the banks? We don't give ourselves our own mandates, right? No, no, but I heard the word mandate somewhere in there, right? No, we can't choose our mandate and the scope of our mandate. But we have a vision and guiding principles at the Bundesbund. I think that was in 2016, Mr. Lober, right? Yeah, okay, he's nodding at me, good. So I recall that in these principles that guide the, um, the Bundesbank, we looked at three fundamental aspects, and that is to act economically, sustainable, sustainably, and focused on the future. And in all three of these areas, e economically, sustainably, and f focused on the future, um, these matters play a role. And it was a deliberate choice that we made when we established these principles. At the supervisory level, we are currently still working on this. I can see a few colleagues sitting here from BaFin and other supervisory authorities. Uh, I think we are still lagging behind our colleagues in the Netherlands and in the UK here in Germany. So I don't think that we've quite yet um, tackled the topic fully yet. The Bundesbank of course, still is the Bundesbank, even though we're now looking into these matters as well, but it's not a change of mandate. Just one more question concerning guiding principles. Mr. Knott just mentioned it, using paper cups made of recycled paper and um, using 
or consuming only fair trade coffee or making bank bills uh, made of organic cotton. Yeah? Yes, yes, oh, the Euro 2, yes, <laughs> Mr. Thiel is nodding, our ma bills are made of the same materials. <laughs> okay, glad to hear that. <laughs> That's uh, reassuring. Same paper, okay. <laughs> so, Mr. Dumbrett, this is a very deliberate question. To what extent should uh, the supervisory authorities promote this topic? Should it just be a dialogue, an intensive exchange of views, or do you think there will be a need for more involvement? Well, I think first and foremost, the banks and saving banks should approach this topic themselves. It's not enough for the supervisors to say this is what we expect. I think it's up to become active on behalf of the banks and the uh, savings banks, like Klaas said, because it's not just risks, it's also about opportunities, and I think that's the best approach to address these issues. I'm looking at Mr. Lupa again. Um, that's why we need to think about these things. I'm not con convinced that uh, we always have to intervene or interfere as supervisors. That's not necessarily the case. 10, 15 years ago, uh, class, I think you said five years ago, um, we wouldn't even have considered this topic yet. Well, 10, 15 years ago, many of the IT issues we're aware of today wouldn't have been on any agenda yet. So supervisors in Bafin don't know what technologies are best and should be used by banks and saving banks. The whole idea behind dialogues like these are to uh, see whether there is awareness, uh, whether people are conscious, whether they are making deliberate decisions, whether they are preparing and making plans. When I was an apprentice at, in the bank, which was quite a while ago, I admit, uh, there was no IT, head of IT. There was no real IT department. There was like a support group, but there was nobody at executive level in charge of IT. So things evolve over time and talking about risks, assessing risks, taking into account how risks are considered in analysis and so on. Things that have become standard when it comes to the topic of IT and which can lead to penalties in terms of uh, capital requirements, for example, such developments will most likely now take place when it comes to uh, sustainability issues and climate change matters. And if to, Mr. Lubra and I should uh, agree, and I saw other colleagues over there as well, um, that there may be financial institutions completely unaware of potential risks they may be exposed to and see no need to price in those risks in any way, well, then I'm sure that our dialogue would have to intensify. Okay, so uh, I just heard you say that do not have penalties yet when it comes to capital requirements. That yet was interesting. Mr. Not, I'd like some further explanations. You said facilitating um, green bonds, uh, promotion factors or uh, support factors are something that you do not favor, but it is something that is currently being discussed at the European level. Could you maybe give us an idea, an impression of where these discussions stand? Do you think these facilities, this type of support will um, prevail or will more cl classic or traditional banking or supervisory approaches prevail? And particularly since the plan is only coming out tomorrow, so tomorrow we will know <laughs> what our efforts have yielded thus far. But I hope you are um, not very surprised of what... I would not be that. surprised if, despite sort of our uh, position in this, there would be something on it in the financial action plan. Well, I would continue to then sort of point out the risks of, uh, of such an approach. I don't think it is our job to direct any sort of uh, investment flows I think there have been efforts in the past to have preferential risk treatments for, for specific categories, and I don't think that the experience with such preferential treatments is, let's say, un unambiguously positive, um, and it, it would provide a short-term boost, uh, undoubtedly so, but I think uh, it will 
mean uh, increased uh, uh, risks, increased exposure for which there is not sufficiently uh, sufficient amount of capital being set aside. So in some places in the financial sector, it will end in tears, and then you have to mop up again, and etc. So I, I prefer to rather prevent this. Uh, and I think actually, if it's all about relative relativity, it's is green finance sufficiently attractive relative to brown finance? And I repeat what I said before. I think brown finance is too attractive now yeah. because the risks are underpriced. So let's right. fix that problem okay. rather than fixing one problem by creating possibly another, another one. Maybe another one, yeah. Ich halte es für ein grundsätzliches Basically, I believe that it's a problem if here in this forum we say on the one hand there's great risks coming from climate change and secondly, on the other hand, without normal risk orientation we can tackle certain projects. Banking supervisory authorities are there to help promote good risk assessment and not in order to promote or incentivize certain sectors of industry particularly. Even though I know it's always a delicate issue when the Bundesbank is asked to speak about the ECB, I do want to ask a question concerning the possible purchasing program of the ECB for green bonds. How do you feel about this uh, preference for certain assets? Well, I'm going to speak on behalf of my colleagues, even though I'm not on the ECB Council. Right now, we are in a phase of absolute silence and utmost confidentiality. We have meetings today and an informal dinner tonight. I think it would be a bit too early to ask that question. Well, I'll ask again on Friday then. Let me take a look around the room. I was told that I am allowed to do so to see whether there's any questions from the audience, you who will be affected down the line by these things. We do have ladies here with microphones. There's actually one question over here in the audience, uh, third row, front, please. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Oliver. Hagedorn, Ibesco, CEO. I have a question concerning the 28 central banks, I believe it's 28 in Europe. Um, why do they find it so difficult to develop best practices when it comes to climate change? Learning from each other is what I'm referring to. And what are you doing in order to counteract this fact? trying to do, of course, is to learn from each other as much as possible, and that is one of the reasons why we uh, started this network for the greening of finance, and uh, this network is not at all meant to be a closed shop, although it was not sort of started at the level of the 28 uh, being a sort of official EU initiative. It's nonetheless, of course, a network uh, that, that wants to be inclusive, and, uh, and there are actually Yeah, there is more interest than just the eight uh, institutions that I uh, that are that sort of are among the among the uh, founding uh, fathers, and and I think one way forward in this area, I think, is through the identification of best practices. That's typically, I mean, for all of us, it's uncharted territory. For uh, you bankers, it's uncharted territory, but the same is of course true for us. So why try to invent the wheel 28? times separately and why not sort of share experiences uh, as much as possible, learn from each other and, uh, and disseminate the things that we learn uh, relatively quickly. Absolutely, that's correct. The fact that there's a small founding group doesn't mean that the eight institutions believe that they can make it on their own, quite the contrary. Um, we need to include stakeholders from outside of Europe, India and so forth, we will need to bring them on board. We have no chance without them and especially the United States has to become part of this circle. And the uh, International Monetary Fund, for example, needs to become part of this as well. But sometimes it can be easier if you start something with a small group of stakeholders, but it's certainly not an exclusive round and anybody who's interested in getting involved is invited to do so. And I think, as Klaas said, there is great interest in this as well. There's another question at the back of the room. The microphone's on the way. Johannes Voigt, Deutscher Sparkassen Giro Association. 
we wrote a smart you wrote a smart paper am i right it's possible it, perhaps but thank you very much for the compliment if you want to support institutions in understanding climate change the biggest challenge in this case is the enormous amount of surveys and studies which contradict each other, which are guided by vested interests, which aren't always transparent in these terms. So it will be difficult to find uh, a level on which all can agree. For an individual bank, bank or a group of banks, it's almost impossible to do so. Do you think it would be possible that the Bundesbank or maybe also outside the Bundesbank, something could be developed which could help achieve greater transparency when it comes to the common level of knowledge that we share? To give you a, some, an example, doctors may sometimes be in a similar situation when it comes to the efficiency or effectiveness of thir certain therapies or drugs. And there's a cotton library that you can use in order to evaluate different medical studies concerning consensus, contradictions, common ground, and making this information available to doctors. Couldn't we have a similar database evaluation? Well, first of all, it's wonderful that there's any studies being published about this topic uh, already, and we shouldn't prevent this, and that studies may contradict each other at time isn't new. I don't think that's something to be too concerned about, but what Mr. Knud also said in his presentation is something that I would like to underline. The action plan by the European Union, which uh, requires or calls for a taxonomy and common definitions that they want to develop together, that is an, a very important initial start. And that's not something that can be launched by the Bundesbank or by the uh, Netherlands Central Bank. It's something that has to take place at a supranational level, and I find that very promising. I certainly hope that this action plan will give us guidance and that it will pay off. The panel with Mr. Brannes and Mr. Bräunig uh, from KFW um, and Mr. von Molke from Deutsche Bank will also be there to discuss the different points of view and perspectives that we have. There will be a documentation published after this um, symposium as usual, and it's okay to have different points of views and different studies with different outcomes because we don't know what the future may hold. Uh, diversity of opinions is okay. Yes, but collecting them together in one type of database or something, is there a cons consideration like that? Well, I haven't considered it yet. And what about you? I'm aware of, but I also think that in this area where there is a lot of debate and there are, there are sort of disagreements as to uh, the extent of climate change. There are disagreements to the extent to which it is man-made. Uh, some of them are acknowledging that there is climate change but are disagreeing sort of with the impact that uh, carbon emission plays, etc., etc. I would say two things. First of all, science has to progress in a dialectic way. So thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And you have to have a certain amount of debate. So let's not centralize that debate too early because we no, may only miss to collect all what. Yeah, we may out. we may miss some of the arguments. But a more important uh, point that I'd want to make is even when there is significant uncertainty, I think some of the tail risks are simply too discomforting for us not to act. So uncertainty should not translate into an inaction bias because you don't know for sure, etc. Uh, essentially, we are leasing this planet from our children, and we don't want sort of to take the risk today that when the stage is there, that our children are in charge, that it's too late, it. and that we cannot correct anything anymore. Even if uh, I totally agree, there is no perfect certainty uh, in this uh, in this in this realm. But I think the uncertainties are just too large for comfort, and therefore we have to act. Mr. Freud, maybe you can t assume this responsibility as your public duty. Are there any other questions? I do need to keep track of the time, though. Mr. Schick over there. Sorry. I was looking towards the very back of the room, but there's a question right here at the front in our second row. Thank you. I think it's wonderful that the Bundesbank is addressing this issue. I'm wondering whether the other two supervisory institutions 
in the German banking industry, the central bank and the Bafin are also moving along the same lines or does it, will it take more impetus from perhaps Berlin? Are you synchronous in your approach or not? Well, impetus from Berlin is always welcome, Mr. Schick. <laughs> we always need that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Schick is a member of the German parliament, in case you weren't aware of this. So, Bafin, and of course, I cannot speak on behalf of the Bafin. I saw Mr. Gutner and Mr. Russo is coming later today. But uh, within the group of the central banks, and it's not just central banks, I think we can rest assured that Bafin will soon be represented directly as well. And of course, we also inform them on a regular basis. I'm not informed about where the ECB stands on this right now, but as far as the German supervisory authorities are concerned, we are on the same page. And there was this founding core that um, started this process, and Bafin was certainly committed to the process from the beginning. Say that uh, uh, that this, uh, in my view, it will be inevitable that this will also arrive at the, at the table of the SSM. And I may recall that in 2016, when uh, the Netherlands held the EU presidency uh, at one of the informal ECOFIN meetings in Amsterdam, we also tabled this issue. And the European Systemic Risk Board, which is uh, chaired by President Draghi, also for that roundtable produced a table on climate-related risks for financial stability. So I think it is already on the agenda. At least the ESRB has taken it forward. And I think uh, we will see more of that uh, in the future. I'm quite convinced about that. Impulses are always welcome, of course. But I think, uh, yeah, we're pulling on the same rope here, uh, we say in Dutch. <laughs> Um, Mr. Dombret, Mr. Not, maybe one closing question, which of course would require a crystal ball. We are still at the very beginning, uncharted territory and whatnot. But if we think 10 years ahead and think about the 30th um, Deutsche Bank Bundesbank Symposium and the dialogue 10 years from now, how green will the financial sector be by then, Mr. Dombret? What do you hope for? What do you dream of? How successful will these efforts initiated today be? I'm completely overwhelmed by this question. Um, I do not know what developments we're going to see in the next 10 years. I'm certain that it's going to be a topic that's going to stay on the agendas. It will have positive and negative implications, but I find it extremely difficult to make any forecasts, especially such long-term prognoses. I certainly do believe, though, that this topic that in Germany for the first time is being addressed by the financial industry and the supervisory authorities together talking about green finance that it will become a common uh, topic that will have been identified as a potential risk by everybody. If you look at the insurance industry and the reinsurance companies, this topic unfortunately has already become a completely ex uh, accepted standard quo. It needs to be assessed in terms of risks and ramifications and exposures. But we're not just talking about green. We're also talking, first and foremost, about sustainability, which goes above and beyond green topics. So there's going to be new aspects that will have to be considered as well. And not just uh, in green terms, I spoke about the changes in the energy industry. I spoke th about the infrastructure and transportation industry. We spoke about other type of logistics chains and so on. We really do not know what the effect on these different industries will be in the next decade, but there will certainly be substantial uh, changes. Mr. Not will it be technological um, changes or what do you think will the driving factors be? But I'm optimistic. I think uh, politics needs to set the framework. It needs to set the goals, and the goals are now formulated in terms of uh, the climate goals for 2050. Ten years from now, I do think we should be able to observe a measurable improvement toward those goals, because if not, we have to step up uh, the efforts, because ten years is already quite a, a significant, uh, a significant uh, time period, I think. Um, but by setting the goals and creating a stable regulatory and political framework, that is the best that the financial industry needs to invest. And that's when I believe innovation will come and innovative projects will find 
finance. But of course, the financial industry needs certainty. It needs longer term certainty. And that's why I think we will also have to experiment with mm. public private partnerships and all kinds of commitment devices mm. yeah, that there is also buy in from, uh, from the public sector, that it doesn't renege on its, uh, on its, uh, on its commitments. And let's closer to home. I gave an example on the podium of data gaps that we had on the sort of real estate yeah, yeah, effi yeah. energy efficiency labels. In the Let's hope that 10 years from now at least such data gaps have been resolved, that I can give you complete data on these energy efficiency labels, that in Germany you will have complete data on sort of the, the extent to which the car industry is yeah, exposed uh, still to diesel engines, etc., etc., so that these data gaps at least are... Uh, are being resolved yeah. so that we know what we have to do, we know what we're talking about. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you.